Friends, we're here at the uh, Jill Stein Gathering, Hobo Hall in Detroit. It's very cold here, so well, not a lot of people show up. I won't be surprised. It's cold. You must be from California, sir. <laughs> yes, I am. And I don't mind saying so. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to speak then because we're getting started. He won't let me use the microphone, so I'm just going to yell out. My name is Ray Les with Citizens Overnight. I'm from San Diego. I want you to take a look at the results, the official results that have come out from the state. You look at the precincts that were actually counted. Actually counted, and Hillary Clinton was ahead by 3.75%. 74,000 votes. <laughs> And they shut down the recount at that time. What it was ahead in the actually can counted precinct by 74,000 votes, 3.75 percent of a lead against Donald Trump. That's in the official results. Now, of the official results, we have 10 point whatever percent uncountable precinct. If you multiply that out to the average size of a precinct of half a million votes that they were not going to consider recountable. Half a million and only 11,000 votes separating the candidates. It's a mess. This, this Michigan uh, recount was the reason they told it was because it was becoming an embarrassment of, for Michigan and how what a mess they had. Only counted 35%. That's not just a small percentage. 35% were actually recounted by hand. And of those 35%, more than a third, you're talking to you like 3.75% over Donald Trump. You can't just pull the plug right now and say nothing is wrong here. You have to continue to run it. And the reason they pulled the plug, the Republican Secretary of State pulled the plug because. They saw that it was a complete mess. They were going to have more than half a million uncountable ballots at the end. And that, that, that it would be a complete embarrassment and that likely Hillary Clinton would be the winner in Michigan. He, she's already ahead in the ones they've recounted. How can Trump take it? Only be in the uncountable. The uncountable precincts are the ones that they fixed the election and then they made them so that they would never be recounted and therefore their fix would cover it up. This is the cover-up. They have a recounting law in place that does more to cover up than to recount. So we need to take a look at those numbers. Take a look at the official results. Compare the fact that Hillary Clinton is leading in the ones that they recounted by 74,000 votes. 3.75% of the current numbers. She's got a lead. Well, now we have to wonder why are they suppressing the, those precincts and making them uncountable if she's that far ahead. This is Jeremy, Thank you, Ray. Ray Lutz, Citizens Oversight. We are citizen, election activists, so come to citizensoversight.org and you can see the situation there. We went to six counties here reviewing what was going on. Thank you, Ray. Detroit. This is what democracy looks like. Not the Trump elections, but those who are fighting for the right to vote and the right to a vote that we can trust, which is accurate, secure, and just. We need to count every vote and make sure that every vote counts. And that means we have to put an end to this de facto Jim Crow election system. That is why Detroit is a hot mess. Yeah. Because this dysfunction in our elections flows downhill. It flows to communities that do not have resources. Do not have resources in our schools, but do not have resources in our ballot places, in our elections departments, so that the equipment that is used is a prone to break. It's likely to break. And it's not just these 87 scanners that failed in Detroit on election day. This is not the exception. What the U.S. Civil
civil rights agency tells us is that this actually is the rule, not the exception. And in fact, they said that if you live in a community of color, the odds of your vote getting misread or going unread or being thrown into the garbage can is actually increased 900% that your vote is going to be basically thrown away. And in an election where we started out knowing that there were these 75,000 blank votes, votes that didn't have a recording in the presidential slot, it was a red flag to start with. This is a sky high number, far higher than anything that has ever been seen before uh, in the state. And we raised questions. And when we tried to answer those questions, you see what we got. We asked, do we have a voting system we can trust? No. And we got a resounding no. no. We do not we have a vote system we can trust. We ballots night of the election at the polling place they where do. the ballots they are cast. We absolutely and we do. pay people <laughs> right. so, for example, <laughs> We need a voting system that does have integrity. We need the hand marked paper ballots. We need either to hand count it or some say to count it with the machines. But we if we do that, let's let's have a debate. I think a lot of people don't have facts on there. Keep going, keep going. So, you know, we need to speak to what just happened and what we need to do about it. So that means getting rid of the electronic voting machines, which I understand are already gone, and that's a first step. But we have to be very sure that if we are using scanners, we need to be cross-checking them. We need automatic audits. And, you know, I think this debate can go on. Actually, there, there is yes. a legitimate debate here about whether they, in fact, should be hand-counted or, or whether they should be, the or whether they should they take for two yes, weeks. there's a big problem with the absentee no ballots and all the rest. So we can come to that, too, in a moment. There is a legitimate debate as to whether we hand-count them or we count them with machines with audits to make sure that those counts are accurate and we need to have automatic recounts. We shouldn't have to hold a bake sale on steroids and raise millions of dollars in order to have the assurance that our vote actually counts. Our voting system, as uh, described by one of the federal judges who reviewed this case in the 6th uh, District Court of Appeals, what he said was that this is the bedrock foundation of our democracy. That the recount is about ensuring our Show right to vote. Not our. Go that look this, at website and that this is about ensuring we have the right to vote. To be and that Thank we you, have sir. Right Thank you so to much. To be assured that Show that vote, vote is actually accurate and not correct. Hard. Let me say a word about how much this costs. Because it's outrageous how much this costs. We paid about $1 million in order for the right to recount, but then we were told that if we actually got the recount, it was going to be another $1 million or maybe another $5 million. Like in Wisconsin, where we started off at $1.1 million and it was raised to $3.5 million. So it's not only, this is economic extortion. That's right. This is extortion. And we were also taught that we would have to pay it. That is, we who undertook this recount would have to pay it retroactively if it went through. We're also threatened with that, with a potential one or five million dollar fine after the fact, a retroactive fine. And then you have the issue of cronyism, which which cronyism and, and a political house of horrors going on here, where you have judges who are uh, in, the, uh, in the inner circle, two of the Supreme Court judges, in fact, who are on Donald Trump's short list of potential appointees to the, uh, to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, you have the Attorney General of Michigan filing lawsuits to try to stop this case. Uh, 
in the three states where we filed recounts, we had we had Donald Trump, we had um, we had his super PACs, we had the Republican Party. They were pulling out all the stops, and you have to ask, why are they doing this? Uh, even George Bush did not do this. George Bush did not try to obstruct. I mean, the Supreme Court did his work for him, but he did not. He was not in there uh, fighting to uh, save his neck. So you have to ask, what is Donald Trump afraid of? What is he afraid of? He does not, either he does not have faith in democracy, or he does not believe that he actually won this election, or he would not be trying to stop the vote. When we undertook this vote count, this recount, we didn't know who the winner was in Michigan at the time. The votes were still being counted, and it was not finally declared. We didn't launch this recount in order to help one candidate or hurt another candidate. This is about helping voters. Helping voters have an election system we can believe in. About 43% of eligible voters decided not to vote in this election. This is a national scam, shame and a scam, let me say. A national shame and a scam that we do not have enough confidence in our vote to actually bring people out to vote. So this is something that we're doing for everyone. And we're not just saying that this is all to blame on the Republicans, because if you look at what happened in the Democratic primary, there's plenty to be worried about there as well. And let me add that if Hillary Clinton had stepped up to the plate and had not basically thrown in the towel here, then if she had filed for a recount, she would have been acknowledged by the court. They said that I didn't have to ending because I wasn't going to win. Well, actually, I think that actually gives me a lot of standing because I don't have, I have a, a skin in this game except what we all have in this game. All of us are at risk, but Hillary Clinton could have done it with the existing flawed laws. She could have assured the people of Michigan that you can have confidence in this vote, or maybe you can't, but she could find out and she didn't. So, you know, there's still Blame go around among among the political parties, and this is about standing up for all of us. Going forward, we're going to keep up the fight. We may be moving out of the court, but we're moving into the court of public opinion. And public opinion is that we deserve a democracy. And there are many steps to that democracy. We see a lot of voter suppression in its preferential failure of voting infrastructure, preferential failure in oppressed communities. So voter suppression is happening in the counting or the not counting of the vote, but voter suppression also happens before you even get to the voting place. Millions of voters, and I want to give a shout out here for Greg Callis, who's done so much to help draw attention and shine daylight on the incredible obstruction of the right to vote, particularly through this thing called interstate cross-check that uh, essentially can wipe your name off the voter rolls just because you happen to have a common last name among Latinos or among African Americans. It's absolutely unjust uh, and outrageous, and it's believed to have prevented potentially millions of people from voting. So we need to be united across the many links in this chain that suppresses our vote. And that means in the voting, the lack and the assault on voting integrity itself, it means the suppression of voters before you even get to the polls. Uh, also, we not only have a right to vote, but we have a right to know who we can vote for. In this election, most people were voting against the candidate they hated most and against the candidate they were most afraid of instead of for the candidate that they truly believed in. And a lot of that has to do with not knowing, <laughs> a lot of that is not knowing who you can vote for. People were screaming for more voices and more choices, 
and they, they were prevented from learning about them, especially in the debates. We need a People's Commission on Presidential Debates, not this corporate Democratic Republican Commission on Presidential Debates. That doesn't mean we have 20 candidates on the stage. It means if you are on the ballot in a state that you could actually win it, a candidate, people deserve to know about you as a choice. That would have four candidates in this list, not two. It would have meant a real debate about what wages ought to be, that wages should be a living wage, a minimum of $15 an hour, not this $12 an hour that sometimes Hillary advocates for. We need to have a real debate about living wages. We need a real debate about health care. And it's not about how do we privatize it, it's about how do we ensure it for everyone as a human right through Medicare for all, the only way to get to health care for everyone, and it doesn't cost us any more money. The American people deserve to know about that. They deserve to know, we deserve to know, that more than half of our discretionary budget is being squandered on these outrageous wars for all that are not making us safer, they're making us less safe. They're creating false states, mass refugee migrations, and worse terrorist threats. Did you hear that debated in our two-party presidential debates? Whoa. No way. Were you aware that almost half of your income taxes are being spent on exactly those wars? Most people don't know that. But this is true. And this is why, you know, we need to we need a new kind of foreign policy based on international law, human rights. That is the road to security. And through diplomacy, not through uh, massive uh, economic and military uh, muscle uh, flexing and oppression. Right. So there's a way forward, but we got to be able to discuss it if we're ever going to fix it. So we deserve those open debates. That is a third pillar of how we need to move forward. And a fourth pillar is that a lot of people were voting out of fear. They're voting for the lesser evil because they were just too worried about the person they didn't want to get in office, whether that was Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. I mean, there was fear all around. We deserve a voting system where we can bring our values to our vote. If we're just voting against the person we hate the most, or the person we're most scared of, you know, that's not what democracy looks like. Democracy needs an affirmative agenda. It needs vision, it needs values, it needs a moral compass. We are that moral compass. We deserve to live in our lives. So that we, we can vote for the greater good, not for the lesser evil. Voting for the lesser evil is a lose-lose proposition, and we're on a sinking ship on this course. But we can liberate our votes doing what the state of Maine did. They enacted ranked choice voting through a voter referendum during this election. That means, yeah, that means you go to the polls and you can rank your choices. You can vote for an underdog that you believe in. Because if your first choice loses, your vote is automatically reassigned to your second choice. So you never have to worry about inadvertently helping a candidate that you are really scared of and that you don't want to get into office. You can actually control how your vote is used through ranked choice voting. So this is just to make the point that we can fix this broken system. And I want to salute everyone here that was a part of this valiant, principled, and courageous fight that will go on. If not in the court of law, here in the court of public opinion, we are going to stick together. We're going to fight for these election reforms. And um, in the state of New Mexico, for example, in 2004, they were blocked in the courts. They tried to do a recount, and they were stopped. But instead, they pushed ahead, and they were able to pass the laws to change their voting system so that they can actually have confidence in the vote. They have automatic recounts, and, and they have uh, paper ballots, and they do have um, auditing to ensure that. So we can keep go going here. We are not stopping. What we have brought to light is how this system is a hot mess, as Anita said. So we are not going to stand for it. 
we are going to work harder and stronger and more courageously until tomorrow. Thank you all so much for being Thank a part you. of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll take a few questions from the press uh, over the next five minutes or so. Um, all right. What's your answer with the government? I live in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I will be here. You know, whether I'm running for a local office or not, I'm here to help Michigan, you know, stand up for Michigan. And, and I so appreciate the fight that's going on in Michigan that you guys just have such uh, spirit and integrity and courage. So, you are, you are inspiring a whole lot of people all across this country, and I'm here to support you and I will continue to be. Stein in the green. Uh, we wanted to ask, uh, will you be considering running in 2020? And um, that awesome fundraising, fundraising campaign that you put on, yes. can you see that as a barometer to help with your input, helping to build the Green Party into a more broader coalition of people who may want to join? Great, great questions. Um, so, in the, in terms of 2020, you know, I um, I describe myself as a mother on fire. Yeah. And, and for all those mothers on fire out there, you know that you can't put the fire out. <laughs> Nobody can put the fire out. So, you know, we're here, just like the fathers on fire, and the sisters and the brothers on fire. Right. It doesn't go anywhere. So, you know, we're here in. I get out of bed in the morning to fight as hard as I can in whatever way that I can. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here to fill whatever role I can most useful in. So that's as much as I know about 2020 right now. But, um, you know, if I'm still breathing, I will still be fighting in one way or another. Great, 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 great right. Rolling Stone, does this mean that this is the, that you're throwing a towel on the recount? Um, no, we are not throwing in the towel on the recount. So, you know, we've... We've exhausted what we can do here in Michigan, and I think at this point we'll have to roll over into what our fight looks like on the ground. And I think we need to fight for those reforms. Uh, we need to fight to ensure that we have a vote we can count on, and there are many pieces of that. That includes fighting the voter ID bill, which got through uh, the House, but as I understand has not yet gone through the Senate here. So this is about sticking together, and I really encourage everybody here, if you haven't signed up, because this is about getting connected and staying connected so we can keep fighting. So I really want to encourage you to sign up, either with the Green Party here, or sign up on our campaign website so that we can keep moving forward. And about that money that we raised, that money is dedicated to the recount. So it's in a segregated and dedicated fund. It cannot be spent on the party um, according to FEC rules and all that. you got to spend it on the recount. But if there is money left over, which is not exactly clear that there will be, but if we are lucky enough to have money left over, we follow the FEC guidelines. If they allow us to continue spending that money on the ongoing effort to fight for voting integrity, then we will be distributing that and ensuring that we keep that fight going. What do you think about the electoral college system? Do you support it? Oh, it's, it's outrageous. You know, it was part of the slavery system, <laughs> and and it should be abolished. Uh, we should have a national popular vote. Absolutely. And and there's there's talk about you know a movement now and potentially even another legal case that some people are talking about that would call for the uh, uh, the proportional distribution of the electoral college votes. It wouldn't be a national vote, but it would amount to the same thing. So you know, I'd say stay tuned and let's see what happens with that. I know there's a lot of um, you know uh, conviction and passion around this. It's absolutely outrageous that our votes are just distorted by the Electoral College. So there is a fight that's going to go on, and that's absolutely part of democratizing our elections. Whether it will happen in time for this election, you know, uh, that's a steep hill to climb, but I think this is a fight we got to fight. One, one more question. What's the status of the recounts of the other states, and where are you headed from to have this? Great. So after this, I'm going to Wisconsin. Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin uh, their recount has proceeded. They have uncovered 
a lot of problems in that recount. Um, and particularly in Milwaukee, they, uh, the recount has been done by machine rather than by hand, which is outrageous and is another example of Jim Crow elections. That, uh, that people in communities of color, where communities of color are um, especially concentrated, that they're denied their right to uh, any kind of assurance that this vote is okay.